Hello and welcome back to Probability Theory. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady, via PayPal or by other means. Now, in today's part 13, we will talk about the independence of random variables. Of course, the notion of independence you already know from part 9. However, as you might remember, there we talked about the independence of two events. Hence, only such subsets of omega could be independent. Now it turns out that it can be very helpful to define the notion of independence for random variables. In other words, also two maps can be independent. Now the question is, for two random variables x and y, how do we define independence? Or to say it differently, how do we get back to the independence of events? Indeed, this is not hard to answer, because x and y map omega to the real number line. Therefore, we just have to look at pre-images of x and y to get a collection of events in omega. In fact, we know that the pre-images of random variables are important, because they are by definition measurable. For this reason, we know that all pre-images generate a sigma algebra that lies inside the original sigma algebra. And of course, the same holds for the other random variable y. The good thing is that for real-valued random variables, it turns out that the sigma algebra can be generated by just looking at these half-sided intervals. Of course, we have to look at the pre-images of all these intervals here, but still it makes our life a little bit easier. So in summary, by looking at the pre-images of all these intervals, we find a whole collection of events here. And in the case that each pair of events, one from the sigma algebra generated by x and the other one from the sigma algebra generated by y, is independent by the definition above, then we call the two random variables x and y independent. First, this seems like a strong property, but we will see this is exactly what we need. However, before we talk about this, let's first fix this with a definition. As often, we take a whole probability space, which means we have a sample space omega, a sigma algebra A, and a probability measure P. And as you have seen above, what we also need are two random variables x and y. Please note, both are real valued and defined on omega. Then, we say x and y are independent when suitable pre-images are independent. Indeed, the pre-images we need I have already showed you above. So we take a lowercase x and a lowercase y and then we look at the pre-images of these half-bounded intervals. In other words, these two events now should be independent. Indeed, this should hold no matter which lowercase x and lowercase y we choose. In other words, in the worst case, we have to check here infinitely many pairs. However, then this is the property that makes the two random variables as maps independent. Okay, not later than now, you should recall what it means that two events are independent. It simply tells us that the intersection inside the probability measure can be rewritten as a product of probabilities. Hence, p of the one set intersected with the other set is given as p of the one set times p of the other set. And now since we have pre-images here, we can simplify this notation even more. On the left hand side we can write this is x is less or equal than lowercase x and y is less or equal than lowercase y. Then of course we could do the same thing on the right hand side. Hence there you should recognize that we have the CDFs we introduced in the last video. What I mean is that we have the cumulative distribution function of x and of y. So the product fx times fy. In fact, on the left hand side we also find a CDF which is more or less a generalized CDF. I say this because as you can see there are two variables involved. Hence we would write f of lowercase x and lowercase y. Then, of course, the question is, which random variable do we put in the index of f? 
Indeed, what we also need here is the pair x and y. So please note, this is not a real valued random variable and therefore not a normal CDF as here. However, of course we can just define that this is the CDF of the random variable or random vector x, y. Hence, here the input space is still omega, but the output space is R2. In summary, with this, independence is easy to remember. It simply means that this CDF can be written as the product of these simple CDFs. Moreover, I can tell you, this here is often called the joint cumulative distribution function. Okay, then I would say, let's look at an example here. And I want to keep the example very general, such that we can see that often independence occurs. Indeed, this works with a product space where omega is given as omega1 times omega2. Then, the random variable x should live on omega1 and the random variable y on omega2. More precisely, this means when x gets two inputs, lowercase omega1, omega2, then it does not care what the second input is. Or in other words, it's just a function of one variable, the function f, with input omega1. So maybe here, just think of a simple example when you throw two dice. Then omega1 represents the first die, so we have the numbers 1 to 6, and omega2 represents the second die. In this case, x could be the random variable that looks at the outcome of the first die. Which means x of omega1, omega2 is simply just omega1. Then, in the same way, the random variable y should look at the second die. Hence, it does not care what the first input is. In other words, we can write it as a function g of omega2. Okay, so when we have these two assumptions, we can conclude that the random variables x and y are independent. For example, the outcomes of our two dice give us two independent random variables. Indeed, you will see in a lot of cases we have exactly such a construction here. And therefore, the independence is immediately given. Now, if you don't see this implication here immediately, try to write down this equality here for our two cases here. Then you will easily see that this equality holds. Okay, now when you see this product space here, you might remember that we also have a product space with infinitely many components. Therefore, the notion of independence for infinitely many random variables might also be useful. Indeed, this will be the last definition for this video. Now what we have is a whole family of random variables called xi, where capital I could be any index set. For example, it could be the natural numbers. And now we call the whole family of random variables independent if we have a similar equation as before. More precisely, this means on the left hand side we have the probability of an intersection and on the right hand side we have a product of probabilities. So let's write the product of j and capital J of the probability of xj is less or equal than lowercase xj. Okay, there we have the right hand side. Now you might have already seen I have written capital J instead of capital I because the equation should only hold for finitely many family members. However, it should hold no matter which finite set J we choose. This means that we go through all finite subsets of I. Maybe the only exception would be the empty set. And then, you already know what we have to find on the left hand side. It's just a list of inequalities like this one. However, in order to keep it short, we also write this one as a tuple. As before here with the comma, it just means that all the inequalities are fulfilled. Hence, we get a subset of omega and can measure the probability. Now, in summary, if this equality holds for all real numbers lowercase xj, then we call the family of random variables independent. So you see, it's the straightforward generalization of the independence we had for two random variables above. Indeed, this definition is very important, so please keep it in mind for the next videos. Therefore, I hope I see you in the next video and have a nice day.
Bye.